If you'll open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy in chapter 5, we'll be starting in verse 17. And this message is titled, Restoration of the Pastorate. Restoration of the Pastorate. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, Let the elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. I charge you to keep these rules without partiality or without prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in laying on hands, nor take part in the sin of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your, for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them into judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot be remain hidden. And brothers, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> God, I thank you for your word, a precious gift that the book of Psalms says is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, we pray for the power of your word to be illuminated to us by the unique power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for those of us who are in Christ, the Spirit illuminating these words inside of us, God, opening our blind eyes and unclogging our deaf ears. Lord, I pray that these words, though, for those outside of Christ would be something that draw them, draw them to you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we will continue to see what it looks like to, to be part of a biblical church and what a biblical pastor looks like and how we are to conduct ourselves as the body of Christ. Lord, conform us to the image of your Son. Lord, raise us up to be used in this dark world, in this dark hour for your glory, God, because we know how it ends. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony because we did not love our lives unto death. Well, the Bible says those who long to save their life will lose it, but those of us who have already given our lives up to your service, God, we have found life and purpose and everlasting life in you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In this section of scripture, Paul elaborates on the lofty responsibility that it is to lead God's people as a pastor. Now, some of you are new and you might say, well, I'm not a pastor and I don't plan on being a pastor. But like I've said all through this series, if you are a Christian, you will have a pastor because the body, the Bible says, do not forsake yourselves from the gathering of yourselves together as so many others have done. The Bible calls us and commands us to be part of the local church. And this is to be part of the body of Christ. And so that doesn't mean all people in the local church are truly part of the body of Christ. There are people who go to church and come close to God, but never surrender their lives to him. But those of us who are part of his body, we are called to worship God corporately and to gather ourselves together for the mutual edification of each other as we hold each other accountable, as we hold each other up in dark and in, in, in desperate seasons, as we um, express love and gratitude towards God together, as we um, engage in the gift of the spirit for the mutual edification of the church. And so this is what God has called us to. And so in this context, Paul has, has basically, and it's been a while, so I'll just remind you, the reason Paul wrote this letter to Timothy is also to write a letter be, uh, on behalf of Timothy. So Timothy could take this as the authority of God, the authority of Christ to the, the city of Ephesus and say, listen, this is what the apostle says. I'm here on the authority of the apostle who is made an apostle on the authority of Christ Jesus. So we've talked about rebuking false teaching, 
uh, dispelling them, giving them an opportunity to re repent and, re and return. If they did not, they were to be sent out. And then he talked about uh, building the body back up and restoring order to the church. And so this message in today's chapter is really about the restoration of the pulpit of God. And even though this isn't exactly the same thing, this is, has an eerie similarity to the book of 1 Kings where the prophet Elijah came back uh, to try to pull the people back from idol worship and wickedness. And before he dispelled and put the prophets of Baal and Asherah to the sword, he took a stand on Mount Carmel. And the very first thing he did is called the people together and said, listen, Either serve God or serve Baal, but you can't have it both ways. And the very first thing he did after that was, it says, he rebuilt the altar of the Lord. So in a New Testament context, Paul is aiding Timothy in rebuilding the, uh, the, uh, the altar of the Lord as he helps him rebuild a biblical pastorate and installs biblical pastors. Paul in this section of scripture says <clears throat> that it's a lofty responsibility to lead God's people as a pastor, even saying that those who labor in the area of preaching uh, and teaching are worthy of double honor because they are rightfully handling and dividing the word of truth with care and integrity. And this is so important. Listen, the works we do as the church are so important, but if the message is wrong, we will be corrupt. There are many churches that have an apostate message, but do some good deeds. Our good deeds and our good works should be a reflection of the word and message of Jesus Christ. Amen. And all things should flow from that bane. And every biblical church is led from the pulpit. Led from the pulpit that charges the people of God to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus in a lost, dark and dying world. It's also very important that we understand that the action and living out of the message is not neglected here. Paul makes it clear just in the, the script, the passage we studied the last time we were together, <clears throat> that this should express itself as serving widows and orphans and helping the poor. So there is not a neglect on actual putting feet to the message, but he's making sure they understand without the true message, the feet might run the wrong direction. Paul also warns us that while we should hold pastors in a very high regard, giving them honor. It also doesn't mean <clears throat> that we are to put up with a pastor who is breaking uh, the sort of uh, qualifications that are given to us in the first part of this book. Not all sorts of failure is, is on the same par. And so he gives us some sort of directives of, of when a pastor should be disqualified and, and when he shouldn't. But it's important to say, though, that here he does make it clear that we shouldn't just take any slanderous uh, remark made against a leader. Listen, if you're preaching the, the true gospel of God, it's going to ruffle feathers. So any sort of one-off accusation shouldn't be taken in consideration. But he does say, listen, if there's a plurality of witnesses and a plurality of evidence that action should be taken and they should be held to a much higher standard than the average Christian. That's why I believe that a church is only healthy when there's a plurality of elders, not just the one anointed man of God who is above being in any sort of, uh, no one can talk to him, no one can touch him. No, there should be elders who maybe aren't the main preacher, but also have uh, authority in the church so that they can hold each other accountable before God's people, but mainly before God himself. Here's something I like to talk about a lot. But often the prophets of God in the Old Testament were hated for confronting people with the truth of God's word. And this is why allegations when it comes to someone who has earned your trust as a pastor, we should not rush to judgment, but we should be fair and consistent and we shouldn't show partiality one way or the other. So we shouldn't show partiality because that preacher said something I didn't like and so I wanna make an allegation against him. Oh, someone said something bad about him. But on the flip side, we shouldn't show partiality either. Yeah, I know he's, he's living a different life behind the scenes, but you know, he's my friend or he's a nice guy. Or you can even flip that around this way. He doesn't preach the truth of God's word, but he does a lot of good works. 
The consistency of a pastor's biblical lifestyle should be should be held to their to their life and their message. <clears throat> Being a doctor has some high rewards in our culture. Being a doctor, you know, people respect you. It's a prestigious position. Uh, being a doctor, you have the satisfaction that you're doing something important as you help people stay healthy and, and in some cases actually save lives. Typically, they have above average compensation. You know, almost, I don't, unless you're working in some sort of clinic, I don't know any doctor that doesn't make a six figure income. And as they become more specialized, their income rises. But with the prestige and the paycheck and all the benefits and rewards that come along with being a doctor also comes a great responsibility. See, you can't just show up and say you're a doctor and show up at the hospital. Yeah, I watched ER a lot when I was growing up. I think I got this. No, you take a great responsibility because while you're given some authority and you're given a high paycheck and you're given prestige, you're also given a great responsibility. See, if you commit malpractice, you could be sued and lose your license. You might even go to jail. So as you're trying to help people, you're also living on a double-edged sword. It's hard to be a doctor. You got to make life and death decisions. And today, so many preachers who have not spent the time studying and going to medical school or, or learning how to rightly divide the truth or becoming mature in their faith, stand behind a pulpit and preach a message to suit their own desires. We need to hold them to a high standard. But those who do give us the word of God and walk it out and model us and lead us in a way that is biblical, they deserve double honor. Paul is saying the same thing of the true and biblical pastor. Alistair Begg once said that the church is not a democracy, democracy that the people rule, but it's also not a dictatorship where the pastor rules. The church is a theocracy under the authority of one, and that is Christ. And that authority is displayed and given to us in the Bible. So any authority I have over you as a pastor is given to me biblically. And anything that I ask of you or do to you that's outside the biblical constraints is out of bounds. And in some cases, maybe even disqualifying. Because I too am under the authority of God's word. And God has given men authority in many avenues of life. That's why in Romans 13, it says to submit yourself to the governing authorities because there is no authority that God hasn't instituted. Now, there are some authorities that we think are corrupt and bad, but we're still to obey them and, and, and submit ourselves to them unless what they're asking us to do contradicts what God is telling us to do in his word. Today in the church, we have many men who want the authority and position of pastor or elder but they want it without the serious responsibility that comes along with it. Acts 20, 28 says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, giving an admonition to men who are going to be pastors. It says, give yourselves attention to all that the flock, pay careful attention to yourselves and to your flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. So when you're a minister or ministering, listen, not just pastors, to people of the church, keep this in mind, that God bought them with the blood of his son. He paid a high price for them. That's one of the reasons Jesus said that you will, I'll know your love for me by your love for each other. Because you too are a blood bought saint. And when I'm dealing with you, I'm dealing with a blood bought saint. You're precious to Christ. And I better treat you like you're precious to Christ. When I make decisions as a pastor, they better be in honor and glory of God and for the benefit of the people under the sound of my voice. Now, sometimes that's not always going to be what you want. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's correction. Sometimes it's rebuke. Sometimes it's a hug. Sometimes it's crying together. But it's always bearing one another's burdens and walking together as we walk down the Calvary Road towards our eternal reward. This is why pastors today often shy away from the language of shepherd that is given so clearly in the Bible, because they want to avoid the responsibility 
that's encapsulated by that role when you talk about being a shepherd. A shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. <clears throat> Instead, they want to be called global communicators or public figures. Or uh, what is the other one? Uh, some sort of a speaker. I can't remember the motivational, motivational speaker. There we go. <laughs> motivational speaker. I'm none of those things. I'm a shepherd of God's people, an under shepherd of the shepherd. And I better do my best to shepherd in the way that he would shepherd. I better take it seriously. Just like a doctor. It's a serious responsibility. It's an important responsibility, but it's a serious responsibility. It has great rewards, but it also has great risks. Let's get right into it. Let me just say this. In many churches today, ones that are obsessed with numerical growth, money, and influence live like they have responsibility towards no one but themselves. Or sometimes to gain those things, they chase the wants and whims of the people. But the true shepherd, and hear this, the bibl biblical pastor or biblical elder is not responsible to the people but yet he is responsible for the people inside of a holy God. Let me say that again. The biblical pastor or shepherd is not responsible to the people. I'm not an elected official who's trying to get reelected. That's a different job. I'm not responsible to you. I'm responsible for you and that in sight of a holy God. Verse 17 says, let the elders who rule Rule well, be considered of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. <clears throat> in Paul's plan to restore the health and fidelity of the church, he commands that the pastor hold a place of honor. We have already established that we are to hold pastors accountable to their biblical responsibilities as prescribed in the first part of this epistle. But he also says that we should esteem and honor those who strive to walk it out and who labor in the jobs God has given them. And he says, especially those who labor in the area of preaching and teaching because they are the administers and the messengers of God's word. First Thessalonians 5.12 says, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. Be a good church member. Hey, listen, in Sunrise, be at peace among yourselves. Don't be part of the problem, be part of the solution. When you look at the leader that's over you in this context, the person who's mentoring you and encouraging you and helping you, don't be part of the dissension. If you're a person in Christ, aim things back towards God. It's not saying to go along with some leader who's telling you to do something unbiblical or wrong. No, it's saying if, if, the, if the avenue that they're going down is for the benefit of God, submit yourselves to that. Be part, listen, be at peace. Be part of the body of Christ. People's lives are on the line. If in fact you are in Christ, to labor in the study of theology and scripture, the true biblical pastor is a task that many people will not undertake today. They buy sermons on the internet. They um, just say whatever comes to their mind. They copy what Mike Todd is saying or Stephen Furtick or whatever other motivational speaker is talking. But the true preacher labors and studies and prays over you and the words they preach wanting a message from the Spirit of God to give to his people as he looks deeply and intently to God's word. Laboring in, in, in the study of scripture is work. Laboring in prayer is work. To labor and wrestle with the text is work. Men who call themselves pastors but do not labor in the study of God's word should be ashamed because they are not doing the work of a pastor. They're trying to be like a doctor who doesn't go to medical school. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, but can rightly divide and handle the word of truth. And this is for pastors specifically, but it's also for you. 
the ministers and messengers of God because we are not all pastors, but we are all ministers. And we should be careful to rightly divide the words of truth, not try to use them to win an argument, not try to use them to get our way and manipulate a situation, but with a pure heart, with a pure mind, using them to glorify God and to draw people towards God and to build brothers up in the faith. And when you correct someone, doing it with the heart of restoration and love that you hope will be administered to you when you too need correction. And guess what? We will all need correction at some point, including myself, including the most noble pastor you can think of. <clears throat> Verse 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wage. So not only should you give honor and respect to the biblical pastor, but Paul says that the pastor should be able to make a living by preaching the word of God through the giving of the people at the church. The labor is worthy of his wage. It also says that those who are diligent in this labor deserve double <laughs> honor. That doesn't mean they should get a double paycheck. What it's saying is, is you should provide for your pastor. The church should provide for them. It doesn't give us like specifications of how much. Obviously, there's many warnings against pastors who are greedy for gain and desire to be rich. So I think, you know, each church probably has to make that judgment on their own. But I think a pastor shouldn't stick out one way or the other. He shouldn't be conspicuous to his congregation because he makes a thousand times more than they do. And he's driving around in Maseratis while, uh, you know, they're, you know, struggling to pay their bills because he's an inner city pastor in Detroit. But I also think on the other side, he shouldn't be conspicuous. If you're the pastor of a Seattle church in a suburb, that the pastor shouldn't be wondering how he's going to eat that week or that if his car is going to start. I don't think we should be conspicuous one way or the other. I think we should, we should be well. We should have a car that starts and food in the fridge. And we should just be people who work for, it says he's worthy of his wage. You build houses, you're worthy of your wage. You plumb, you know, lines, you, you flip hamburgers, you're worthy of your wage. And so we don't need to take this too far one way or the other, but a pastor deserves to be taken care of. Now, Paul himself, because he had so much conflict with the church, said, while I could take a salary from the church, I'm not going to. I'm going to make tents. And listen, there's something very noble about making tents to preach the word of God. All through Oklahoma, there are men who work full-time jobs because the church they go to can't support them and their family. And they go and they mow lawns all week or they work in the oil field or they, or they do, they do janitorial services or they do some other farming job so that they can support themselves so that they can spend another 15 or 20 hours in their Bibles and in a prayer closet so that they can go to church and witness and preach the word of God to 30 people that they are completely devoted to. And let me tell you something. There's something very noble about that. And those men deserve double honor. Verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now hear me, this doesn't mean we cover up sin or turn a blind eye to misconduct, not at all. But it does mean that when we're dealing with trusted men of God who have earned the right to be where they are and they've lived lives that have, that have shown that they are trustworthy, we shouldn't take accusations lightly or without evidence or without witnesses. And this is imperative when it comes to ministers. Because listen, a false accusation against a minister, listen, if you take his credibility away, you, you've taken everything away. So please hear me. I'm not saying we try to cover up to protect them. If they're guilty, then the sin needs to come out. It needs to be exposed. The, the, the rotten branch needs to be cut off the tree. But we need to be careful. So be careful. Be careful. Don't entertain false allegations. Don't be a slander. Don't be dissension. Second Corinthians 13, one says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Paul's not, Paul's not pleased with the Corinthian church. It's the third time I've had to tell you this. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. <clears throat> and this isn't just something Paul came up with. For ministers, this is a biblical concept that goes back to the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning of the Bible, it says uh, in, in the book of Exodus that before we convict someone in, of anything, 
every matter needs to be established by the witness of two or three. We shouldn't discredit the reputation of a proven and faithful elder unless the matter is established. But then there should be action taken. And if the minister has disqualified himself, he should be disciplined. And if the, 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 the violation is grievous enough, he may have disqualified himself and even been removed from ministry. Verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the, so that the, met, the rest may stand in fear. It's saying if a preacher misuses his place in the pulpit, say it out loud. If you, if you let a pastor go because he's having an affair with his wife, make sure everybody knows it because you don't want someone to think that you are endorsing that sin. And this comes to the deeds of ministers, but this also comes to the words. Things that are done in the open need to be rebuked in the open. That's why when people say, how dare you say something about precious Joe Osteen? You don't know him. And yes, he speaks the most vile and unbiblical heresy. He says it in such a nice way. Listen, I'm not slandering the man. I have no problem with him. I've never met him. I don't know how he treats his wife by all appearances. Seems like a super nice guy. And he probably treats people well. But the word of God is that he preaches isn't the word of God. It's not even a sub-Christian. It's opposite of Christianity. And it's my duty to stand up and say that that is not what the Bible teaches because he is openly spewing false teaching. And it's my job to openly rebuke it for, your, for the sake of you. I'm not on some hobby horse. I don't enjoy it. If there's a pastor that I knew that was engaged in some sort of sin where he was stealing money from the church or uh, cheating on his wife or doing something like that, and I knew about it for sure, and other people knew about it, I better, I better speak up. I shouldn't show partiality. Well, I know Kevin. He's a pretty nice guy. He's, you know, he, felt, he messed up a little bit. Now listen, just like a doctor, when you take the responsibility, you take all that comes along with it. And yes, you do live under a microscope as a pastor. That's why the Bible says not many of you should be teachers. Because you will be judged twice as strict. But we always correct and rebuke in the hope of repentance and restoration. But hear me. And hear me good, but not all restoration means that you would get back the things you squandered in this life. Now, sometimes you do. I mean, even not as, just as a pastor, there are, there are things that you've squandered in your addiction you might not get back. Some of you might not get your, your wife back. Some of you might not avoid prison. Some of you might not get that great job back that you squandered. And as a minister, there's no guarantee you're going to ever get a congregation back, much less your own. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I'm a pastor here. I work under Lauren. If I was caught doing something grievous that disqualifies an intern, how much more should, should the penalty be for me, the person who stands up here week after week and preaches? No, for the sake of the body, Lauren would have to say, man, I love you, but you're fired and you can't do restoration here. You've got to go somewhere else. And that, so I can't sit there and go, but Lauren, I've asked for forgiveness. And now I want to come back and lead these people. Going, no, I forfeited that. Now, that doesn't mean that if I go through Team Challenge somewhere else and, and surrender my life to God and go through a season of restoration, that God won't open another door and even restore me to a place of, of leadership or maybe even a place of leadership here. But it's not promised. It's not guaranteed. And we should, we should be in fear and awe of the things God gives to us, especially when it has to do with people. Being so self-centered. It's not about me. It's about people that God has entrusted to me. I say this all the time, and my wife likes to repeat it often. <clears throat> but people always say, show me grace. But grace is for the gospel. See, when you, when you rebuke someone, it doesn't mean you're going to give them back everything that they squandered. But it does mean if they, if they ask forgiveness, that, that you forgive them. See, what we're really seeking here when we, we, we take a pastor out and, and send him away is not, not that he's going to get everything back. But that his soul be saved. The soul restoration is what matters. Jesus says, listen, better to enter the kingdom of God without one of your hands or one of your eyes than to enter hell with your whole body intact. 
And this is, this is true for the body of Christ too. Matthew 18, 6 says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have grabbed a great millstone, fastened it around his neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea. Maybe some point you'll see one of Lauren's teachings that we filmed when we were in Israel recently, but a millstone is about this big and it's heavy. Four men probably couldn't pick it up. And you, it's on a, a device that you pull it around and, and it rolls in a circle and grounds things up. He's saying it's better to take one of those things, cast it around your neck and throw yourself in a sea than to do something that causes one of these little ones to sin, to mislead people in the faith. <clears throat> it's a hard task to rebuke a sinning elder or to openly rebuke a popular false teacher who is preaching a feel-good message that are causing people to stumble. But Paul wants to make sure that those of us who are called to the pastorate will not shrink back from this responsibility. Just like the prophets of God, the message of God's correction is not a popular one often, but it's a necessary one. <laughs> Paul reminds us that we should be more concerned about standing, standing blameless before God than what men will say about us. By giving us this charge, listen, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, he says, who will judge the elect, and, or who, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels. So we have to stand with a clear conscience as we rebuke false teaching, false deeds, uh, corrupt deeds, and as we rebuke those who sin and disgrace the high calling of being a pastor. But we should show honor and respect to those who honor and respect the office of pastor, the office of preaching, the office of teaching, teaching God's word, and we should expose those who dishonor God in word or in deed. We can't make these judgments based on human partiality, though. Instead, we have to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing out of the spirit of partiality, Paul says. Not like, hey, man, it's my chance to get this guy because I don't like him. You can't err on the side of being harsh and you can't err on the side of, of covering up sin. And listen, it's not to the benefit of the people under your sound of voice, but here's the real truth. It's not to the benefit of the person either. When, when King David was called out by the, by the prophet Nathan after he slept with Bathsheba and had uh, Uriah killed, it wasn't just for the sake of the people of Israel. It was for the sake of David's soul. And David responded pro properly. Not, he didn't respond by going, oh man, what's going to happen with my kingdom? What are people going to think? He said, I have sinned against God and God alone. <coughs> and God still used him. He was repentant though. Because he was more concerned about what God thought than what happened to his, his kingdom or his life or anything else. <clears throat> okay, verse 22. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. If you come from a hyper charismatic background, you may have heard this, but I'm about to tell you this has nothing to do with what the scripture says. I've heard people say before that be careful when you lay hands on people to pray for them. Or you might get a demon or something. That's, that's not what, if you read the scripture in context, you know that's not what it's saying. It's talking about ordaining people. The idea of laying your hands of authority on another man and saying, I am ordaining you as a pastor. So it happens here. There's men that come through the school of ministry and they've proven themselves over time and they've, they've done uh, a certain amount of education. And the, the assembly of God says that we're going, to, we're going to make these men minister based on your word. And I look at their lives and I say, yes, I am in agreement with this. And we go before a, a congregation of people and we lay hands on them and we anoint them as ordained ministers in the sight of God and in the sight of people. So Paul says, listen, as, as we're rebuilding the church, where we're clearing out false teaching, we're reestablishing the pastorate. So a way we can avoid the problems we got into before is don't be hasty or quick about who we lay hands on. Let's, let's think about who we're, who, who we're making the leader of people. Let's have a structure in place. Let's have a time of them proving that they're mature. Let's watch them walk out their faith a little bit. Let's make sure they know God's word. Let's make sure that they're men of prayer. Let's make sure that they're men of the spirit. Let's take time. Don't be hasty. 
And there is times where people are hasty because you see someone who's very charismatic and exciting and they have a mouthpiece and you think, man, that guy's got it. But for their benefit and the benefit of others, we need to take time and make sure they have character as well and make sure that they have a true knowledge of God's word. So he's saying, listen, don't be hasty in ordaining pastors. Take time. Think about it. So now Timothy had begun the difficult task of casting out false teachers and correcting the people uh, and then putting the church back in order. Paul says one of the most important things going forward is not to be quick to ordain men as pastors. These men need to be tested and true in doctrine and in character. To raise men up that you know are unqualified or living in sin or just immature in the faith, Paul says you share in their sin. So make sure you keep yourself pure because you have a responsibility. In this place, I have a responsibility to you as I'm governing them. Now, this is a second chance place, so maybe the standards aren't exactly the same in the church. But if I knew one of these men are living in a way that, that I wouldn't allow you to live in, they're going to be rebuked and corrected. And if the sin is grievous enough, they may have to go down and sleep next to you in the bunk. And if they're not willing to do that, they're going to have to go. I can't ask you to do something that our campus pastor isn't, isn't doing well or that I'm not doing well or that Brandon's not doing well. And, and as, you, as you get more authority, I, can use, I mean, I'm just using Teen Challenge as an example. Student has uh, so much grace. An intern has a little less grace. A staff member has a lot less grace. The pastor of this place has very, very little grace. The executive director of this place has no grace. If Lawrence smoked a cigarette, he'd be fired. It'd be over. He'd be gone. If he did, you know, had one week, I just did meth one time. We can't trust you to lead other ministers and other men who are leading students. It's not mean. It's for the benefit of, of the body and for the person who gets rebuked and corrected so that they can return to a clear conscience before God. <clears throat> Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. But keep watch of yourselves, lest you be tempted too. So the longer you let sin go on, not only are you responsible, but the more likely you are to be drawn into it. If you were desperate and in trouble and wanted to come back and you were at a crack house and you said, dude, I'm, I'm desperate. Please come get me. I'm in trouble. I'd grab another brother and come get you, but not while you hang out for a little bit. Be standing on the porch and jump in my car. I ain't going in there. I hadn't smoked crack in a long time. I'm not afraid. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to tempt myself. But keep myself pure. I'm going to live my life above reproach. Kind of a weird example. Verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and free, frequent illnesses. Now, now here we see this often in the book of 1 Timothy. Paul's giving these large, lofty, you know, sort of governing principles, but he's also at times interjecting personal things directed at Timothy because he loves Timothy. So he's saying, do this for the whole of the church. And by the way, Timothy, make sure you do this. So my interpretation of this through the whole context of the letter is this. Because Timothy was trying to live a life so far above reproach, and we know for sure that there were people that are engaging in drunkenness and misusing of wine, Timothy probably has said, listen, I'm, I'm going to abstain from all appearance of evil. So because see, in the first century, we didn't have pure distilled drinking water. The water was sometimes corrupt and people had stomach ailments and not for the sake of getting drunk, but people would use just a little bit of alcohol, not enough to get drunk, but to as medicine. They would take a drink of it and, you know, it'd clear out their insides. And, and so maybe Timothy had decided, listen, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to take medicine. Like, I don't even want, I want people, I want my witness to be intact. <clears throat> and Paul's saying, listen, I, I understand what you're doing, but you also need to look out for your health. Because there's evidence from First and Second Timothy that, that Timothy had a, a, a history of being sick, having physical maladies, 
He mentions it specifically in 2 Timothy. So he's saying, listen, I understand you're trying to live above reproach. I, I honor that, but make sure that you take a little medicine. Drink a little wine after dinner to, to clear yourself out. I mean, he, makes, he says it right there. Why? He said, because of your frequent elements. So don't, don't get yourself sick trying to prove a point. It's okay to take medicine. It's okay to take care of yourself. Don't go too far. Don't be legalistic. <laughs> Verse 24, the sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, but even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So Paul closes this chapter by making a profound and ominous statement. Remember in verse 21, it says that we are living in the presence, not only of men, but in the presence and under the watchful eye of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels. And a person who lives his life like that is a person who can uh, overcome sin in any stage of his life. See, many of us at the beginning of our walk with God are trying to please people. I mean, that's why we can't not do it when we're by ourselves. The awareness of God, the fear of the Lord, knowing that Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead is in view of all things, sees all things, changes the way you live your life. You've heard people say this sort of in a joking way, but would you be able to watch porn if you could see Jesus sitting next to you on the couch? But he is sitting next to you on the couch. So you wouldn't do it at church because some, for some reason you're sort of aware of the presence of God. But the more mature you become in Christ, you become aware of the presence of God inside you. And eventually, brothers, that's what's going to save you in this place is because it doesn't matter if the intern is around or not. You're living for the glory of God under the watchful eye of God and you want to live a life that pleases God. And that's the person when he has a chance to sin and even get away with it says, I, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore because you're aware of the presence of the Lord. And it doesn't say Jesus Christ. It says Christ Jesus. And it uses his name in both ways in the New Testament. And they're intentional, especially when Paul does it. Because when he says Jesus Christ, he wants the idea that Christ was a man who walked among us to be what we think about. But when he says Christ Jesus, he wants the office as the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one, the judge to be the thing we think about first and foremost. So he says, you're in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and all of the elect angels, meaning the ones who didn't fall with Satan in the beginning. The angels and, and God, they see everything. That's why he said in another place just a few verses ago, we rebuke them openly so it will bring fear to the congregation that they may not fall in sin as well. Luke 8, Luke 8 17 says, listen, for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. There is nothing you've ever thought or done in this life that will not be laid bare before you on the judgment day. We are to be pure and undefiled as the bride of Christ waiting for Christ's return. And as pastors, we are responsible to God on behalf of those he's entrusted to us. But while we do our best to keep the body of Christ pure in the earth by dealing with things that we know about and things we can see, we have to rest assured that ultimately that Christ himself will purify the bride. He will wash it clean. He will separate the sheep and the goats and the wheat and the tares. Let me say it this way. You might be able to get over on me, but you can't get over on God. This is why we need the word of God, because it opens our eyes and it exposes our intentions in a precise manner, exposing our need for Christ. <clears throat> See, exposing sin is what shows us our weakness and need for Christ. When we truly see who God is, we see who we are. And if you think you've seen God and then feel good about yourself and what kind of person you are and the life you've lived, then you don't see God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
But the reaction the true person has who when they see God is they see their insufficiency to save themselves. They see their insufficiency to walk it out. You come to Team Challenge and instead of thinking, you know, I'm just going to get my right foot in front of the other. I'm going to do better this time. I'm going to get a job. It's going to be fine. I really don't even need to be here, but I'm glad I came. I got sober, right? Now I get to go and I got it all figured out. No, what should happen to you here is your eyes are open to the fact that you are desperate and needy and apart from God, you will fail. And if you don't come to that conclusion, even if you find a way to be sober, you will be sober all the way to hell. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who realize that their goodness isn't good enough, they alone will inherit the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Because what it produces in us is this great need for the grace of Christ. We know, I know I need God. I've been living this thing out for years now. And I'm more aware of my need for God than I was when I sat in that chair where you're sitting. I know it today. Man, I know it. I need God for my next breath. I need God to stay sober. I need God to be a good husband. I need God to not fall back in the petty sin that used to so easily ensnare me. I need him. I need his grace. And that is where surrender to Christ happens. <clears throat> we find this through the word of God, anointed and empowered by the spirit of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing in division of the soul and spirit, of the joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, laying man bare before the sight of God. No false teacher or charlatan can hide from God. And honestly, brothers, no one can hide from God. No one can hide the truth from God. <clears throat> and that should terrify you. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we find out that we can hide in him. You can't hide from God. But through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can hide in him. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Christ Jesus. So the same God who's going to judge everyone has set you free to be in him. If you are in him and he in you, you are not subject to the coming judgment and condemnation. You are free. You are free, not only free to walk through the doors of heaven, but free from sin in this life. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you'll never sin. I'm saying you're free from your inability to break free from sin. You're free from that desire and propensity to do wrong when you can. Instead, now you have a desire to live for God because you love God. And over the course of your life, he's going to purify you and sanctify you. Here's the end. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6 through 9, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Now listen what he says. <clears throat> Such things must come. So some bad things are going to come in life. It's set in motion. Some of these things are actually going to afford the kingdom of God. He says, some things must come. They, they must come, but woe to them who they come through. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown in eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Rebu rebuke and correction is for the sake of restoration of your soul, primarily. Popular teachers are always talking about God's going to restore everything to you. He's going to give you the house. He's going to give you the car. No, the restoration of your soul. Yes. And sometimes he's going to restore the other stuff too. He is going to restore the other stuff too, but in his will and his way. The restoration of your stuff might look like you never having stuff and going and living out your days on the coast of India. 
as you may are a missionary to, to people. It may be that you have a successful business. It may be that you are a lowly pastor like me, but you'll be at peace with God. And that's all that really matters. Listen, God will supply your needs. He says he will. He'll take care of you. He says, listen, if you're being evil, can good, 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 give good gifts to your kids, how much more will I? Or if you're worried about what you're going to wear, look at one of the flowers that I decorated. They're more beautiful than Solomon. And they're, they're, just an inst they're just something we look at for a few minutes and then they wither away. Don't worry about yourself or your stuff. God's got you. But don't get the cart before the horse. Worry about your soul. Worry about having a clear conscience before God. Rebuking, rebuke and correction is for the sake of restoration of your soul. And the grace of God is for the gospel. It doesn't mean you'll always, always recover the things you lost in this life, but it does, does promise you'll be right with God, and that's all that matters. Let me say it this way. For a pastor, better to lose your church than to be thrown in eternal hellfire. Or how about for you? Better to get on D-level by being honest to avoid, or, or, or to avoid earthly punishment so that you can skate by. You know, the true Christian is, is convicted by the truth. You want to live in truth. You want to have a clear conscience. The person who has no desire to change in that context, there may be something wrong with their heart. It's better that than to forfeit your soul. Here's the final scripture, then I'll pray for you. Matthew 10, 26 says, Don't be afraid of them. For there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. I tell you, what is done in the darkness will be coming to light. Speak in the daylight what is whispered in your ear and proclaim it from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. It's the truth or nothing, guys. It's the truth or nothing. Yes, it starts with the pulpit and the pastor. But in the church, it's the truth or nothing. Listen, the person in this place who comes to the place where the truth matters to you more than any consequence, that person will walk out of here a free man. If you come to the place where the truth motivates you more than any consequence, and I'm not just talking about in Teen Challenge. This is a vacuum. This is college. This is where you're in boot camp. I'm talking about in the world. When you're in business, when you're, you're married, because without a love for the truth that comes from the Spirit of God for those that are truly regenerate, you will always fall back into sin. Your goodness isn't good enough. No one can hide from God, but for those of us who are in Christ, we can hide in Him because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord because He's freed us from the law of sin and death. God, I thank you for this group of men. And Lord, I pray for them, Lord. Lord, I'll continue to earnestly pray for them. Lord, I'll pray for the leadership of this place. I'll pray for my dear friends who are laboring in the field, God. Lord, I pray for every man and woman who is laboring for the glory of God and, and, and laboring in your word and laboring in prayer, Lord, to be used by you. Lord, I pray for every man here, God, Lord, that you would conform them to the image of Christ through the preached truth of God's word as empowered by the spirit of God. Lord, let us go out today and live lives for you as we, as we live in this, as the hands and feet of Jesus and salt and light in a world that is dark and dying and lost. In Jesus' name, amen.